Excellent. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, uh, welcome to the fifth uh, lecture in the series to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of the publication of Theory of Justice by John Rawls. Today we have Jeremy Seekings uh, to speak to us about as the ideas of distributional justice and its applications or even known application in Africa. Uh, Jeremy Seekings is director and professor of the Center for Social Science Research at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. His interest is primarily theorizing the best welfare state in global south and he has uh, uh, quite a number of uh, uh, publications in this regard uh, which some of you may already be familiar Today, as part of the uh, proceeding, Professor Jeremy has agreed to first speak to us uh, about uh, distribution justice in Africa, and then engage with us in some discussion in the form of uh, question answers. Um, so uh, I'm sure all of you are eager, and I don't want to be uh, on the way between you and Jeremy. So welcome to Professor Jeremy to begin uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm going to be talking about Africa, but I think that the, the comparison between Africa and South Asia is very interesting. Um, and these are both parts of the world which are often uh, overlooked in, uh, in discussions of, of um, distributive justice and social protection in the welfare state. But, uh, the let me just explain uh, uh, the, my cover slide here. On the left, you have John Rawls. In the middle, you have the first president of Botswana, Seretsi Kama. And on the right, you have the American anthropologist, James Ferguson, um, uh, who, uh, 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 who 2015 wrote a very interesting book that I'm going to be engaging with today called Give a Man a Fish. I'll come back to that later. Now, I should say that, uh, uh, I'm not a political theorist, uh, but I'm very interested in the consequences of ideology, and the consequences of, of norms and values, the roles that norms and values and ideology play in public policy and private action. And thus, in the, in the, in the key question, who gets what? Uh, so I'm a political sociologist. Uh, most of my work concerns who gets what and how uh, who gets what is, is shaped by public policy and private action. Uh, who gets what is, of course, uh, the result of the distribution of power, and in, and in turn, uh, the distribution of power uh, shapes the dist and, and of course, in turn, uh, who gets what shapes the distribution of power, right? But norms, values, and beliefs matter, right? They shape the legitimacy of any distribution, design, of policies, the formation of grievances, processes of collective mobilization and organization, and the consequences of oppression. So I'm really very much an empirical researcher, not a political theorist, an empirical researcher trying to understand the way in which ideas uh, about justice, distributive justice, uh, uh, and norms and values, how they affect uh, who gets what in the real world. My own research mostly focuses on, uh, on Southern Africa. Uh, to a lesser extent, other, other parts of the world. Now, um, norms and values are, I think, especially important uh, for some areas of, of, of public policy, especially social policy, uh, including social protection, uh, social cash transfers, the welfare state, and so on. This is my major interest. Right? The, in, in the field of social protection, debates over who gets what are widely rooted in uh, norms and values over who should get what, i.e. who is deserving. Now, it has been argued that Rawls's theory of justice is desertless, it's desert-free, it's a desert-free theory of justice. Right? But one reading of Rawls's uh, theory of community in, in theory, in, within his uh, within the theory of justice uh, points to the ways in which Rawls's theory might accommodate 
uh, 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 concepts of deserts and deservingness. In this talk today, I want to discuss uh, uh, role, uh, I want to discuss desert uh, and norms and values around uh, distributional justice, who should get what, uh, in lights uh, in, in Africa, uh, and then use this to reflect back on, on Rawls, aspects of Rawls' theory. So in this talk, um, I'm firstly going to briefly uh, think about some aspects of Rawls' theory of justice. Um, then I'm going to consider the, uh, uh, very briefly, the principles of justice that I think underpin uh, most of the developmental agenda globally, and in Africa in particular, um, and, and particularly the social protection agenda, driven primarily, overwhelmingly by international organizations, uh, largely staffed and based in the global north. <clears throat> um, and very much influenced, I argue, by a very Anglo-American conception of, a very uh, Anglo-American conception of rules, uh, as well as of rights. Uh, then I'm going to turn to the main part of my talk, which will be uh, outlining the alternative theory of justice which is widely articulated in Africa, including by African political organizations, now the African Union. Uh, but I'm going to be focusing on the speeches of Suretsi Kama, who was the first president of Botswana uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. Then I'm going to be turning to the, uh, the powerful but qualified arguments made for a basic income grant uh, by uh, American anthropologist at Stanford, James Ferguson, at, and uh, he, he locates these arguments in the discussion of Southern Africa. Right? And then finally, I'm going to be thinking about some of the implications of Suretsi Kama's theory of justice uh, and of Ferguson's arguments uh, um, for social protection and for Rawls's uh, theory of justice. So let's start off with Rawls. Now, I emphasize I'm not a, a Rawlsian expert, I'm not a political theorist. Now, Rawls, uh, Rawls' theory of justice is often presented as an egalitarian uh, liberal theory of justice. Right? Um, and uh, if we think about the, the kind of the key principles in his theory of justice, um, we can see why they are widely labeled as egalitarian and liberal. His first principle, the greatest equal liberty principle, um, seems both clearly liberal and egalitarian. His second principle, though, is slightly more complicated. You'll recall that his, the second principle in his theory of justice involves two parts. The second part uh, is sometimes described as the fair equality of opportunity principle. That certainly seems um, both liberal and egalitarian, that, that people should have fair, equal opportunities uh, to access positions of power and influence and thus to, uh, to shape uh, distribution. Right? Um, the first part of his second principle, though, is rather more, rather more complicated. It's not so easily labeled. This is the, it's the famous difference principle. The difference principle tolerates inequality only insofar as the worst off are better off under inequality than under more equal alternatives. In other words, uh, inequality must be good for everyone, uh, including the worst off, especially the worst off. So you know, this is a, a, the focus on, 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 on the poor is clearly uh, uh, egalitarian, but we need to note that there are at least uh, two important qualifications here. And firstly, the difference principle is only weakly egalitarian. It's, in, it's really a moral theory of inequality. Right? The principles of justice chosen behind the veil of ignorance might accommodate considerable inequality. Um, if, 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 if uh, even those uh, uh, resulting from, if you're lucky enough to be born with um, uh, unequal talents. Right? As long as inequality isn't rooted in exploitation, right? And as long as inequality benefits the worst off, right? then it satisfies Rawls's theory of, of just inequality. Uh, Rawls's uh, uh, theory of, of justice also has um, communitarian features. Right? And we know that the communitarian critique has gone through many stages, 
But there's a whole body of, of, of critics who say that actually Sandel and others were uh, mistaken in, uh, in, in denouncing uh, Rawls uh, for being what we would now call non or anti communitarian. Right? So uh, uh, critics point out that firstly, that Rawls appears to argue that individual self-esteem is constructed through affirmation by others, through processes of mutual recognition, according to shared standards of worthiness. Right? So in other words, you know, the individual, that Sandel's view of, of the, the um, antecedent individuation of the subject uh, is, is, is not a, uh, a fair summary of Rawls's view about how individuals are constituted. Rawls acknowledges that individuals are constituted through uh, membership of communities. Um, and secondly, and, more, and I think uh, uh, for my purposes, more importantly, Rawls' theory is a theory of sharing. You know, in theory of, of justice, Rawls writes, justice as fairness, men agree to share one another's fate. There are limits uh, in Rawls' theory of justice to how far the fortunate can dissociate themselves from the unfortunate. One of the communitarian apologists for Rawls, uh, Roberto Alessandro, put it, uh, Rawls' theory of community is anchored in the goals of cooperation, stability, harmony, and transparency. Cooperation entails mutuality and reciprocity, which means that members of a Rawlsian community are going to share in the distribution of benefits. Some critics of Rawls, uh, some sympathetic critics of Rawls have gone so far as to say that his theory of justice can actually be described as communitarian liberalism, which is perhaps not quite such a contradiction as, as it might seem at first. It combines uh, communitarian and liberal elements in a theory of just redistribution and, and mutual uh, recognition. Now, when we look at the, the field of social protection, <clears throat> right, the, 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 the norms and values uh, underlying the global uh, discourse around social protection, the social protection agenda, right, is a discourse which appears very much rooted in a egalitarian liberal conception of rules. That, in other words, that uh, 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 the, the poor, so at least certain categories of poor, should be targeted, should be uh, uh, the, the, the primary, in a sense, focus of, uh, of redistribution. And this is a, uh, a conception of the rights of the poor, which is, is, is present uh, uh, in a whole series of global uh, social and economic rights documents from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights through to the ILO's 2012 recommendation on social protection flaws. But, but I'm not going to actually read out all of the material on my slides. Uh, I think you can um, read them. Right? But the point is that uh, this global discourse uh, certainly privileges a, a fairly a, a rights-based uh, and an individualistic uh, conception of social and economic rights and rights to social protection. Uh, and this is uh, very uh, present in the, uh, the, the efforts, the lobbying, the advocacy work, uh, and the funding uh, programs of uh, a whole set of, of international organizations and particularly European aid agencies. Now, uh, uh, we would need to qualify that a little bit um, that you know, the, the global discourse uh, 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 is much more emphatic on the rights of certain groups of people, right? And much more ambiguous on others, right? Um, and uh, there are certainly some elements in which uh, the, for example, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights incorporates uh, an acknowledgement of community, um, uh, uh, possibly reflecting its, its, its uh, uh, sources, not simply in Anglo-American thought, but in other branches of, of uh, 
uh, social justice theory. Right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, but when it comes to Africa, right, when African regional organizations uh, engage with the global discourse, they are much more forceful in inserting an alternative uh, uh, elements of an alternative discourse, elements of an alternative conception of social justice. So uh, the, uh, at the regional level, the, organ the Organization of African Union uh, uh, and now the uh, Organization of African States and now the African Union, uh, they, they try and adapt, adopt and adapt the global documents uh, for the African context. Right? And when they do this, they, 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 they do three things. Typically, they downplay social and economic rights. Secondly, they really emphasize the family uh, and the community. And thirdly, they emphasize duties uh, 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 alongside rights. So there's a whole series of, of documents uh, demonstrating this. Now, I think this, the, the point I'm making here about the way in which uh, global uh, uh, discourse and social justice and distributive justice is what I call vernacularized in the African case, this can be reflected uh, uh, and illustrated, I think, more uh, clearly if we look at the, the political, uh, the, the conception of justice articulated by particular um, individuals in particular time. And I want to focus on Suretsi Karma. Uh, Suretsi Karma was the first president of Botswana, um, and whilst he was president, uh, he, uh, he, together with his vice president and his speechwriters, he set out uh, what was, I think, um, a, a fairly clear and explicit conception of social justice, which I think captures in a fairly clear way um, uh, uh, elements of social justice that are very widespread over, uh, over Africa, um, uh, including now 50 years later. Now, we need to know a couple of things about Suretsi Karma before I set out uh, his, his thought. So, um, firstly, uh, he was a traditional leader. He was, by birth, the most important traditional leader in, in Botswana. Um, uh, but he, he, he was compelled to essentially renounce his leadership. Um, and he was the elected uh, prime minister and then elected president. He saw himself as a, uh, as a modern, uh, conservative modernizer. And so one of the things he did was to, to shift a whole set of powers uh, and responsibilities from traditional leaders and chiefs to the new state that he was in the process of building, uh, the, the, the modern Botswanan state. Um, and secondly, the second important point we need to know about Suretsi Karma is that he became uh, prime minister and then president. Uh, and Botswana became independent uh, in the middle of, of, of the worst drought uh, in Botswana in more than a generation, and uh, probably the worst drought in the 20th century. And, uh, and of course, the drought uh, raised very fundamental questions about the role of the state and the responsibility of the state to its subjects. So Sureti Karma uh, uh, articulated a a theory of, of, of social justice right, in response to the challenges of building a modern state uh, uh, in a time of drought, uh, when you, and when you really have to think about what does the modern state do, right, uh, including taking over responsibilities from chiefs. So I'm gonna fairly quickly go through this. I'm not going to read out all of the material on the slides. You can read it, uh, we don't have time, um, but essentially, a Karma's theory of justice was a, an African version of Gemeinschaft, of Tony's uh, concept, the German concept of Gemeinschaft, of community. And, uh, that in Karma, but in Karma's theory of justice, uh, the, the, the rural community, the traditional rural community, was in many respects the ideal. Urbanization was, was, was a bad thing. Right? Um, and we can, just by looking through some of his, some of these quotes here, we can, we can see that, you know, key, key themes keep arising, the dignity of labor, right? Uh, uh, our identity as members of traditional rural communities, right? the importance of equal opportunities, the importance of social justice, uh, and crucially, the importance of self-help. 
Self-help, absolutely crucial to, uh, to Karma's theory of justice. And remember, this was forged uh, in a, in one of the, at the time, one of the poorest countries in the world in the time of drought, right? And so when Karma is talking about self-help here, he says, well, even in times of drought, even when we are, are, are dependent on emergency relief from the outside, we really have to do everything we can to help ourselves. Now, Karma's theory of justice is unambiguously conservative. The goal is harmony. That's the classic conservative uh, um, uh, ideal. Uh, it's, it's a harmonious order. It's also a fundamentally unequal order. It's a theory of just inequality. Here, um, I'm not going to go and read this out. We can see again and again uh, in Karma's speeches, we can see he is praising social justice, equality of opportunity, um, harmony, community, right? And he is very, very wary of the inequalities, the class differences, the class antagonisms, which uh, uh, might accompany industrialization, urbanization. I'm afraid I'm overloading you with material from karma here. Um, I'm uh, overdoing the point really. Uh, but again, more quotes when he's really saying we, all of the members of the community really need to be contributing in, in an appropriate way, right? Uh, that, the, that the better off have got obligations to the poor, but the poor must be helping themselves, must be active and responsible members of the community as well. So in Karma's theory uh, of justice, right, it revolves around sharing. Right? It doesn't, it's not an egalitarian theory of justice, but it's a, a theory of, of, of just inequality uh, based around uh, shared membership of a community and, and hence uh, uh, the shared responsibility within community for the welfare of the poor, subject to the poor, in fact, behaving responsibly as responsible members of the community. So reciprocity is absolutely crucial to uh, to Karma's theory of justice. Now, in the 1990s, 2000s, uh, the political elites in Botswana became very, very agitated about uh, the problem of dependency. And dependency entered the political discourse after Karma's death, right? Uh, but but picked up on on or was picked up in by those who said they were part of his, in a sense, conservative tradition, right? Um, dependency uh, was, was, was denounced uh, as, you know, as we might expect by people becoming dependent upon state provision. Right? But why was dependency such a, such a problem? Well, dependency reflects a failure of development. In other words, because the destitute are not in fact graduating out of poverty, but it also uh, entails the negation of reciprocity right? because dependency Chronic permanent dependency is the antithesis, it's the negation of the reciprocity which underpins uh, shared membership and shared responsibility within a community. So this is not simply a, a neoliberal objection to, uh, to, uh, to dependency, it's a conservative objection to dependency premised on a theory of just inequality, but where the just, the justice theory is crucial there. So individuals, poor individuals who do not uh, uh, demonstrate uh, uh, their, their active membership of the community, who do not behave in the ways, in the reciprocal ways required by community membership, they forfeit, in a sense, their rights to being members of community, and therefore they forfeit their rights to redistribution. They forfeit their rights to a minimal standard of living. They cease to be members of the community of shared faith. And when I interview people in Botswana and, and in many other countries in, in East and Southern Africa, almost every time in my interview, somebody will say to me, you should never give somebody something for nothing, right? The idea that you don't give somebody something for nothing, right, is really the, the very profound state or statement of, of reciprocity. If you give something, if you share, there should be something coming back. 
Reciprocity is crucial to the construction of community and, I argue, to the construction of distributed justice. His, uh, Sereti Kama died in 1980. His son became president in 2008. And you know, he adapted his father's philosophy a bit, but him and other people in the ruling Botswana Democratic Party, the Botswana elite, very consistently still, still articulate what I, what I would call this, this Karma's theory of justice. Now, we, so we have this, this, what I'm calling an African theory of justice, right? Uh, uh, and it's coming, rubbing up against the, in a sense of what I might, we might call an Anglo-American egalitarian liberalism, uh, which emphasizes much more the unconditional rights of the poor. We have the unconditional rights of the poor being promoted by international organizations. And then we have an African conception of justice, which is essentially saying that the, that the rights of the poor are conditional upon their responsibilities as members of, of uh, uh, shared uh, communities. Now, the reason why the international organizations are very agitated uh, and exercised is because Africa is the one part of the world where poverty has declined very, very slowly over the past generation. Right? That, in, in, that the absolute number of people living in poverty in Africa is actually going up. Uh, the relative, the proportion of the population of Africa uh, living in poverty has going down very slowly. So Africa uh, ha has seen economic growth, it's seen development, but without commensurate poverty reduction. And so the imperatives of inclusive growth or inclusive development have driven international organizations to asserting the unconditional rights of the poor, right, as a way of saying the poor must share in the benefits of growth and development. Therefore, what we need is social protection. We need social cash transfers to redistribute to the poor, right, uh, to, to, who, to make sure that they share in the benefits of growth. By and large, in this, the message that international organizations uh, uh, articulate uh, uh, is resisted across much of East and Southern Africa. And it's resisted, I think, because uh, most uh, uh, political elites across East and Southern Africa have a very, very different conception of social justice. They buy into a version of Sereti Kama's uh, 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 theory of justice. Now, the scholar who is, who's grappled with this most recently is James Ferguson. And before Sony gets agitated, I should say, I'm, I am winding up. Um, so, James Ferguson, an American anthropologist, and some of you may be familiar with him. His, his empirical work has always been in Southern Africa, but it's, it, it, it speaks to global issues. Uh, so his, his, uh, his, a long series of books. Right? But his 2015 book uh, called uh, Give a Man a Fish uh, is, I think, a very important contribution to uh, how we think about uh, distributive justice, social justice. Right? He argues that, that the social cash transfers, right, uh, they're important is not just in terms as a mechanism for poverty reduction, but because it pushes us to rethink development away from a focus on production to a focus on redistribution. The title of his book comes from the, the mantra uh, that teaching a man to fish is better than giving him a fish. Ferguson describes this as perhaps the world's most widely circulated development cliche. Now, that idea underpins most of the, dis the global thinking about development for the past 70 years. That what you are doing is development is an investment in essentially the cap capabilities of, of, of people so that they can in fact develop themselves. Right? And uh, the, the telos of development is work. Uh, the focus is on production. The goal is more workers, more production. Uh, now, uh, Ferguson says, thinking about Southern Africa, where there is huge problems of underemployment and unemployment, that the problem of development in, in, in much of Africa is not productive labor. Uh, sorry, it's, 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 it's distribution. Right? That we don't need to actually teach more people to fish. Teaching more people to fish right, is a way of creating unemployed fishermen especially given global uh, uh, scarcity of fish, right? The problem of fishing is not underproduction, but it's overproduction and maldistribution. 
We need a better distribution of the fish to the court, not teaching more people to fish. Now, if the problem is maldistribution, this sounds like an argument for social cash transfers. It sounds like an argument for uh, some kind of basic income grant or, or minimum, minimum income, some kind of, of recognition that the poor have got rights uh, uh, or some kind of a, a claim to a share of the common uh, resources of society. Right. Um, but uh, Ferguson recognizes that actually things are rather more complicated. Right? And, and, he, and, he, and he discusses this by discussing head on this question of dependency. And he says, arguing against neoliberal critics of, of welfare, he says, dependency is not a problem. Right? Pro dependency is actually a necessity for most poor people in Africa. It's only by being dependents that most people can survive because most people are not in fact workers. Dependency, Ferguson writes, is not the name of the problem, it's the name of the solution. I'm sure in, in South Asia, as in, in Africa, uh, poor people invest very heavily in relations of dependency. They want to convert a social inequality into social inequality. They want to, uh, they want to, they want a more just, but then nonetheless unequal uh, uh, distribution. Now, the complication here that Ferguson recognizes is that social cash transfers or a basic income grant or big are radically asocial, right? They are, in, they are according, uh, in a sense, they're recognizing and according rights to individuals independently of their social ties. Now, most of the debate about, about social cash transfers and social citizenship says, these are important because in a liberal egalitarian mode, they are giving individuals rights that are independent of their position in the market. And that's why neoliberals might not like it. Right? But, but Ferguson's coming at this from a different direction. He's acknowledging that across much of Africa, that, that more conservative conceptions of, of social justice are hegemonic. Right? Um, so, he writes, in a world where social position has for so long depended on a kind of exchange of labor for membership, membership of the community for recognition, in other words, an unconditional transfer of cash may seem dangerously empty, a way of preventing the worst in material terms, but without the granting of any sort of meaningful personhood or social belonging. So his problem with, with, with a basic income grant is it's actually undermining community. And by undermining community, it's undermining the possibility of dignity and of recognition of poorer members of the community. It's, rec it's recognizing their needs in some respects, but it's not recognizing their claims to membership of a community through a shared, uh, th 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 a shared community through, con through recipro reciprocity and contributions. So, where does this take us? Well, uh, this is my final slide, right? I think we can, we can see a few things in the African context, right? That recognition is really important and that recognition is embedded in community, right? Poor people in Africa want to be recognized uh, uh, as members of the community. They want claims of members of the community. They want to benefit uh, in, uh, they want to benefit in the community, but recognize that, uh, 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 and they want to be recognized by the community for their own sense of personhood. Right. And we have a lot of empirical evidence on this. Right. Reciprocity is important, most clearly for the non-poor who say, well, that for the non-poor, community must involve reciprocity. But we've got a lot of evidence suggesting that for the poor as well, reciprocity is an important uh, foundational norm uh, of community and of, of personhood. Right. So where this, this points us to the importance of treating individuals, including poor individuals, as responsible and hence deserving members of the community. Now, this is right. We, we shouldn't be focusing on a right to a minimum income in the African context, or a right even to opportunities to earn. We should be focusing on the rights of poor people to opportunities to demonstrate their responsibility, their, their commitment to community, uh, and their claim on recognition their claim to recognition, to their claims to the benefits of reciprocity and of personhood. 
As Ferguson puts it, the task is not to eliminate dependence, but to construct desirable forms of it. Now, Ferguson doesn't go where I'm going to take him now, which is to say, well, the implication seems to be we need to rethink conditionality. Liberal egalitarians are horrified by the paternalistic uh, uh, premises of conditionality. In other words, that cash transfers for the poor should be conditional on things. Right? But communitarian arguments for conditionality, uh, for example, through some form of work, workfare, right? in other words, membership of the community, right? these are much harder to, to, uh, uh, to challenge. Right? Uh, I think that it's much easier for liberal egalitarians to, to, to counter neoliberal uh, uh, criticisms of conditionality than it is to, as paternalistic, as it's, uh, it's much harder for them to counter communitarian arguments for conditionality focused around membership of the community. Now, I think Rawls's theory of justice, right, uh, uh, probably can uh, accommodate this kind of communitarian interpretation. I'm not a I'm not a Rawlsian specialist, so I'm not I can't really engage in the, the finer points of Rawlsian political theory. Right? But it does seem to me that if 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 it's the case that Rawls's theory of justice can accommodate some of these communitarian critiques, in other words, insofar as his theory of justice is a theory of, 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 of communitarian liberalism alongside an egalitarian liberalism, right? Then this has real potential because it makes it makes it po it opens up the possibility of a shared language of rights and a shared language of justice, right? Which will enable uh, 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 international actors, uh, international organizations rooted in Anglo-American conceptions of, of liberalism to actually uh, uh, to deliberate with uh, African, more conservative African uh, uh, political elites and and people, right? And once you once you have that shared language of social justice, right, um, uh, things become quite uncomfortable for both sides. International organisations must think about what conditionality means, um, and uh, African political elites must think about. Uh, uh, the, the, the justice and the injustice of inequality and the extent to which inequality is in fact premised on exploitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, for that excellent lecture. We have uh, several participants uh, who are posted here in the chat. They probably are going to ask questions, but let me take the first opportunity and privilege uh, uh, of asking the question. Uh, especially this was a very good introduction to Kama's theory of justice. Uh, a similar kind of uh, movements and ideas against urbanization have been in several African uh, countries. For example, Julius Nairera's uh, Ujama uh, is a quite a well-known project as well. And you can also see one, one question on the connection between Kama's theory and Ubuntu principles. Uh, but the question that I have is, uh, even in India, there were uh, these kind of community ideas proposed by national leaders. Uh, but we find there are equally opposing ideas in India. Um, for example, Gandhian community in ideas were opposed by a European type of a socialist idea by uh, Ambedkar, uh, uh, because Ambedkar thought uh, uh, communitarianism is going to give dominance for the powerful people in the community, and therefore he did not want a communitarian way of organizing things. He wanted more and more urbanization. Uh, I'm just interested to understand whether there were this kind of counter views to Kama in Africa itself uh, against communitarian views or other type of ideas of justice articulated. Where am I? Um, there we go. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, the, so, um, let me say a couple of things. So, um, firstly, I, I myself am the product of 
um, Anglo-American liberal egalitarianism. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, um, for most of my uh, youth and early adulthood, uh, you know, I was pretty, uh, you know, ob ob oblivious to communitarian critiques. And it was really only when I began to research African skepticism to, uh, to social protection that I really began to actually take conservative, uh, uh, more conservative and communitarian arguments more seriously. Because uh, as, as other researchers and colleagues in this field have noted, um, you know, there's something profoundly uh, distasteful about uh, uh, Anglo-American, Northern, Northern uh, experts coming and telling people in Africa what they should do uh, uh, without actually taking seriously their own, their own um, claims to social justice. Now, uh, when we look at the responses to, when we look at what African political and intellectual elites have to say, there are definitely versions of communitarianism, which I think uh, do not get anywhere close to satisfying a Rawlsian fairness test. Right? There are uh, uh, communitarian arguments uh, uh, which justify um, uh, exploitative inequality, patriarchy, uh, uh, and so on. Right? So um, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not presenting an argument here for uh, for all forms of communitarianism. Right? And I'm not actually presenting an argument for any form of communitarianism. I'm presenting an argument as to why the advocates of, so, of radical social protection reform, for example, the over advocates of social cash transfers for the poor or a basic income grant, why they should be engaging with some, con, some communitarian responses. Right? And, uh, and I think that there is there are grounds for a, a shared language which permits uh, more constructive deliberation than has been the case hitherto. Right? So I think that international uh, champions of, 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 of social justice can engage with the kind of theory of social justice that, that I um, discussed with reference to Suretsi Karma, right? because he is putting forward a theory of social justice. Right? It's not a theory of social injustice. Right? It's, uh, uh, it, it's got most of the elements right, about responsibility for the poor, the responsibility of the state and society for the poor, right, which provide the necessary basis for, for, for discussion. Right? So the, the issues are on the table. The question is, you know, what, what should the state and society be doing for the poor? Right? And if we can find a shared vocabulary, right, then, uh, then people coming from very different ideological uh, backgrounds can at least deliberate over, over, over what that means, right? And so, the so, so I think the Suretsi Karma or people who are in the Suretsi Karma tradition can say yes, right? Let's, uh, you know, there, there are African conceptions of responsibility for the poor, right? And these are uh, often discussed in terms of, of the, the, the Zulu concept of Ubuntu, uh, which is widely uh, spoken of worldwide. The, the Setswana version of that, which was present in my slides, is, is Butu, but it's the same word, right? It's the same one, well, it's, there's a Setswana version and there's a, it's a Zulu version. Um, it's the same concept. The idea that actually uh, communities, there's a, there's, there's, there are just, uh, that inequalities within communities um, uh, uh, have to be uh, uh, sh or should take a just form, and that justice will always entail some kind of redistribution uh, within within the community um, from the more fortunate to the less fortunate. Right, and the question is, the question for our purposes is is uh, it, it, can we can we uh, um, can we agree on in a sense a uh, uh, an approach to redistribution, right? which takes into account conservative or communitarian arguments about reciprocity. Um, and that's the real challenge. And I think, I think that's a conversation uh, which, which could be quite constructive and quite fruitful. It's not, it's not an argument for um, you know, what I would consider deeply illiberal uh, versions of communitarian argument. Excellent. Thank you. Um, 
we have, uh, uh, I am not sure who wants to go first. We have Ben, Ashish, Satvik, uh, and Sarah who wants to ask questions. Whoever wants to ask questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, identify yourself, say who you are before you ask question, of course. Ben, do you want to go first? Thank you, I, I, I can do that. Uh, I thank you very much, Jeremy. I enjoyed your talk enormously. I, I found it very challenging. Uh, and I think you sort of, uh, during discussion, uh, responding to, to Sony, uh, brought to the foreground what, what your intention was. Your, if, I, if I may repeat, what I understood, so you can correct me if, if I misunderstood. You were looking at a variety of uh, justice theories or justice related theories with regard to how do these theories address issues of poverty and what should be done about poverty. And so my question, my first question is, is your reading of the difference principle um, somehow a variation of T.H. Marshall? Is, is, I, I, I've, I've never understood the difference principle like you read it. I always thought it, that, that roles promotes inequality if it serves the least advantaged members of society. But that does not necessarily mean that he accepts or even uh, promotes inequality. Whereas T.H. Marshall actively uh, thinks of social citizenship as something that involves a lot of legitimate inequality provided that everyone has this modicum of economic welfare and security. Thank you. So, so you know, I'm, I read rules in, in, in a sort of a, a Marshall-like way, I suppose. Um, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm reading rules in, in, in the light of, 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 of Marshall. Yes, you, I mean, I think, you know, I, as I, I about to emphasize, I'm not a wall specialist, right? So, uh, but I, 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 I certainly think that the arguments that uh, um, that a, a whole series of uh, communitarian apologists for walls make uh, about uh, the consist about the consistency, uh, the compatibility of of a Rawlsian uh, uh, theory of justice with some communitarian principles. Um, I find those arguments quite compelling, and I find them partly compelling because, of course, they are they they do remind us of of arguments that Marshall made. Um, so you know, Marshall uh, was very clear uh, uh, that it, he, the social citizenship involved obligations. Right? He was never he never really spelt out what those obligate. And I don't I'm not aware that he ever spoke spelt out what those obligations were. Right? And generally, they're interpreted as being obligations to work. Right? But I'm not, I can't recall whether Thomas Marshall actually ever, ever made that quite clear. Right? Um, but I think that, Mar I mean, Marshall certainly had a, he, he was quite explicitly presenting uh, social citizenship as a, as a kind of a curious mixture between uh, uh, equality and, uh, and just inequality, and, and a combination of of rights and and obligations, um, so in a sense that that certainly uh, uh, overlaps with this communitarian defence of of rules. Um, so, uh, does that answer your question? Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Let me also say it's very nice to see you, Ben, and it's nice to see you looking well. Uh, thank you. Um, Ashish, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Staking. So can you, uh, am I audible to you? Yeah, uh, so uh, I, I uh, really liked your lecture. I had two questions actually. It's like one was I, I had posted in the, in the chat that uh, can Africa ever move away from this very um, uh, colonial and 
uh, Euro Eurocentric con conceptualization of of um, uh, justice, which which can be informed from a very Anglo-Saxon point point of view, towards a more um, a grounded and African uh, sense of um, uh, justice, which is which is um, uh, uh, rooted in their own um, broader community as aspects. And one thing that 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 really piqued me uh, more was, was that um, the fact that you stressed that uh, the way community has been has been conceptualized is more from a conservative lens and if you if you if you look at the bi if, if you look at the binaries then the individual perspective is seen as a more progressive kind of lens so how do we negotiate between these source sort of uh, di dichotomies that have been sort of built in the larger hegemonic uh, western discourse and how can africa really form the way for can can uh, give an alternative uh, to the um, especially in a world where we see that, you know, if we take the case of vaccine um, uh, uh, distribution, we see that there is large, there's this massive une unequal thing that is going on. So how can uh, Africa really uh, give an alternative view in the um, 21st century, given all this uh, that I have? Yeah, thank you. So um, the... Uh, so it, I, I, I present karma as karma's version of social justice, his theory of social justice, as a, uh, a, a, a very, um, as a, well, I, I present it as being an almost a sort of quintessentially African uh, conception of social justice. Right? But obviously that there is an enormous diversity of, of, un, of norms and values around social justice in Africa as in anywhere else in the world. Right. And, uh, and one of the problems is uh, with, with the way in which debates are constructed at the moment is that most uh, uh, or many um, African uh, political theorists and philosophers uh, uh, simply contrast a fairly crude uh, uh, African communitarianism against a very reductive Anglo-American version of, of individualistic liberalism. Right, um, and of course, you know this. This both ignores the diversity of of communitarian thought in the African context, and it ignores the diversity of of of, of social justice uh, traditions in Europe. Uh, so, you know, they, uh, you know, I'm I'm I, I, I've been, for example, the, the American the conservative American uh, jurist. Uh, Glendon has written extensively about the, the way in which the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is actually um, widely misunderstood as being an Anglo-American liberal uh, document, that actually it, it really does incorporate uh, many of the sort of the more uh, dignity and responsibility and community focused elements that are present in much, for example, European, continental European social thought, as well as social thought from other parts of the world, and Glendon, um, you know, uh, uh, points to the role that uh, that that uh, um, scholars from uh, outside of Europe played in drafting the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, including scholars from from India, uh, but not from Africa, right? Um, so, so there, so firstly, so you know, if we look at social justice, we see we do see diverse traditions. Uh, in all parts of the world, and setting it up simply as Africa versus versus the West is 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 not a particularly helpful way to go, right? Um, I think it's it's more useful to try and and establish uh, those um, those areas, uh, uh, if you like, the space for deliberation where there is our, our shared concerns and a possibility of a shared vocabulary of justice, which allows deliberation rather than just um, contra, you know rather than just uh, uh, um, establishing contrasts um, but the but in, as to say again in the in the African context right, there are there are uh, there are plenty of, of of people including especially in the political elite who do not subscribe to uh, the entire social uh, 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 the entire karma uh, theory of justice right? Um, Karma's theory of justice is a far more just theory of, of distribution than, uh, 
uh, than most um, wealthy uh, or powerful African people would probably subscribe to, right? Uh, but it's, it's so it's at the it's at the redistributive end of a whole set of of under, of norms and values around around inequality and and uh, distribution and redistribution, right? But because it's because it's at the the redistributive end, I think it opens up the possibility for dialogue and for deliberation, right? Uh, so when we, when you know, when 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 I when I, when I you know, I just spend all the time interviewing uh, politicians and uh, and surveying ordinary people uh, uh, about their views, um, you you find uh, African politicians or politicians in different countries in Africa who articulate shamelessly an extraordinary neoliberal conception of or a defense of of inequality, which which has very 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 few of the of the the the, the just features. Uh, that we saw in Karma's theory. I mean, politicians who will say shamelessly, you know, you know, if the poor are poor, it's their fault. Let them sink. Uh, you know, they they can they can, we don't need them. They can they you know, they're not our they're not our concern. Right. So those you know those are, are quite widespread. Right. Um, so I think there is there is you know the 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 in a sense the more the more justice oriented or the more the more progressive end of benign conservatism right uh, can talk to the uh, to the to the yeah, to a, a less uh, a paternalistic uh, um, uh, a northern uh, justice um, uh, lobby if you like um, so that's the conversation I think is very important right uh, practically I think it's very important because it means that it means that you can, uh, uh, you know, that you could. The when, for example, um, uh, you know, when 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 international organisations sit down with policymakers in a, you know, in in in, in any African capital, and and try and try and persuade policy domestic um, national governments to adopt uh, social protection reforms, right? You know when. If, when that, when you know the, the the African policymakers will typically will typically nod, but privately think that's not what we do. That's not our way of doing things, right? Right. Um, and so, firstly, you want to get beyond the simple, you know, well, thank you very much for coming to see me. Bye bye. There's the door, right? Uh, you want to actually get the, the the conversation going, and to get the conversation going, I think you can, you know, you you want to you want to. You, that international organizations, uh, including donor organizations, right? You know, can 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 should might make much more progress if they press uh, policymakers on what their what their theory of justice is, right? Because I suspect that even even policymakers who don't buy the redistrib the redistributive elements of Suretsi Karma's theory of justice. Uh, might actually feel that it's that they're not going they're not going to want to stake out uh, a, a a a an anti redistributive it's entirely anti redistributive agenda right and so that they might even be an element of 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 shame uh, pushing people to be more karma like than they really are uh, so you know I, my argument is really an argument aimed primarily at international organisations to how they should go about engaging. With uh, policymakers, right? Um, I'm not. I'm not under any illusions to how difficult it's going to be to persuade, to actually persuade all policymakers that you're right. That 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 a sort of a communitarian liberalism is a is a is a common ground. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, it might be possible to 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 nudge um, policymakers into more uh, effective and more substantive reforms than hitherto. We have at least two more questions. One is, uh, uh, both of them are connected. Satvik is asking the question on if we put the Royal CM framework, how will land reforms look like? And Sarah is asking question connected to your second part on uh, dependency theories uh, uh, because capitalists are investing in the farms and how will Africa respond to it? Maybe uh, either Satvik or Sarah or both of them may want to articulate their questions and then maybe you could respond. Right. So, uh, hello, Satvik. Um, hello, Professor. Um, 
Yeah, I will no, manage I'll, I'll... my original question a little bit uh, since we talked about karma. So, how it will look like uh, in the communitarian sense? So, what kind of discussion is going on on land reform uh, issues in South Africa yeah. and theories of justice? Thank you. So, um, karma didn't. Uh, uh, Botswana was never a settler state. Uh, and so Karma never really had to grapple with the problems of land reform in a settler society, right? Although um, he was a, 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 a massive cattle owner and, and was part of, in a sense of the, the Botswana elite, uh, economic and political elite, who, who uh, certainly used their power to advantage themselves in terms of access to waterhole, boreholes and waterholes and grazing grounds for their cattle. Um, but uh, you know, the, the most, most land in Botswana is, is notionally uh, uh, communally owned, right? So that the, the problems that arise in South Africa or settler societies didn't exist in the same way in, in Botswana. Right? Land reform, land reform is a, a, in South Africa um, is an enormously tricky topic. I, and I'll be absolutely honest, um, I don't really know where I stand. And I don't know where I stand because I take very seriously the arguments of colleagues and friends of mine who argue uh, a completely contrasting approaches. Right? I, you know, on the one hand, you know, as you probably know better than I do, there, is a, you know, there's a, there are very, very well-founded arguments uh, in the South African case. I mean, well, firstly, land off, there's, there's, I think uh, there are serious uh, ethical um, and just arguments for land reform, right? The question is what form should land reform take, right? Um, and the big debate uh, around uh, land, in land reform debates is whether uh, land that is redistributed should be under, owned under individual title or should be owned communally, right? And we would assume that the kind of liberal egalitarians uh, would be inclined towards individual uh, titling, individual land ownership. In other words, that, that the small farmers, uh, the land would be redistributed to small farmers and they would have individual title, right? And that's obviously what, um, you know, the World Bank and, and people would prefer for a different set of reasons, right? The, the other argument is that no, that, I, you know, the communitarian argument is that land should be, uh, 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 should be held under some kind of, of collective communal title, right? Um, now, the objection to the, the communal argument is, is that it typically would disadvantage uh, women. And, uh, and women's access to land and claim, and in a sense their membership of the community is gonna be stronger if they have individual title than if they are uh, uh, sharing in collective access to land, communal access to land. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you know, there are progressive, I have progressive colleagues and friends who say, well, actually it's not as simple because, um, that actually that you know it's the best of all is certainly to have a more uh, um, a, a, a more a just community uh, and having people accessing land through a just a just membership of of the community rather than individual title because individual title goes along with all sorts of other problems as well. So I don't really know where I stand on the titling debate. Right, I have absolutely no doubt that both. Uh, uh, both communitarians, uh, community, you know, but both readings of rules would push, would, would, would say land reform is incredibly important, right? Uh, uh, the only question is, well, what form, what kind of titling should, should follow land reform, right? How should it be constructed? How should it be organized? Not whether it should happen. Excellent. I don't see any more hands, but if there is anybody who has a question to ask, please put your hands up or just unmute yourself. I see there is a question from, from Sarah, which I haven't answered. Should I just quickly answer that? Yes, please. So Sarah raises a question about uh, I mean, it's really a form of, and she wrote, Sarah, you articulated as a, as a question about dependency and how the, the rich are dependent on the poor. I mean, it's, I, I would see that really, it's almost a sort of for an argument about exploitation in some way. I mean, we can 
discuss what exploitation means, uh, you know, in a certainly in a non-Marxian, non-Marxist understanding of exploitation. I think what you're asking about is is exploitation, uh, and and I think a Rawlsian theory of justice would would uh, and, and and I think Suretsi Karma's theory of justice. Uh, neither of them are going to tolerate uh, inequalities based on forms of exploitation. So uh, anyone who's defending uh, inequality as just, I think the challenge to them is to say, well, what if if you know inequalities can only be only be just insofar as they are not based on some kind of exploitation, uh, and so then this becomes a you know a, an empirical question. Now Ferguson's argument is is uh, uh, very relevant here because Ferguson's whole book is really premised on the, the reality that across much of Southern Africa, uh, the poor are not poor because they're being exploited, the poor are actually surplus to capitalism. Right? So we're talking about a part of the world where not just underemployment, but unemployment is massive. So Southern Africa has by far the highest rates of unemployment, chronic unemployment, structural unemployment in the world, um, and uh, uh, and if 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 um, if most of those unemployed people were to disappear, the rich would not get poorer, right? So the, the the wealth of the rich, the income of the rich, is not dependent upon some kind of reserve army of labour, right? The poor the unemployment in South Africa, Southern Africa, is so massive, it goes far far beyond any reserve army of labour benefits to to, to, to capitalists or capitalism, right? So, and this is really the premise from which Ferguson, uh, much of my work has been on unemployment and is premised from the work that Ferguson, or, or Ferguson's work, you know, what do we do in a society where actually uh, unemployment is so pervasive, right? That we can't construct a theory of justice around, around exploitation because exploitation is not why people are poor, right? Um, and we can't solve problems of injustice through the traditional productivist emphasis on work, because uh, most people in Southern Africa will never have full employment right, in our lifetimes. It's never going to happen. Um, so uh, what does one do about social justice or distributive justice, given these two premises, that, that exploitation is not the explanation primarily, and, uh, uh, and work is, is not the solution, or a paid, paid employment is not the solution? So, um, you know, how do we get ahead around that? And that's really why he is he is grappling with this question with, with distribution. Right? He say that's why I'm saying actually we should be talking about uh, redistributing uh, the resources that we are already producing more equitably. Um, and of course, as you'd expect from his title, "Give a Man a Fish," um, I mean he's he's also uh, premised he's premising his arguments on uh, on environmental constraints on on production. So that's where he's coming from. Right? So uh, I think that you know, certainly some, as some forms of inequality would be very hard to defend uh, 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 as just, right? because they involve exploitation. But a lot of inequality in Southern Africa would be defensible in, term, in, the, in the sense that it is not, they are not dependent on current uh, exploitation. Although of course they might be they might be the product of, of um, uh, unjust, unequal opportunities and exploitation in the past. Excellent. Um, okay, maybe uh, I don't see any more uh, questions, so maybe we should uh, Close. Let me thank Jeremy for uh, spending time with us and engaging with each question in an interesting manner. And it was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. And a round of applause you can only see on the screen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sony. Thank you, everyone else. Yeah.